The following is a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version. Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we go to air with edition number 1071 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Hurricane Dorian dominates this week's top stories, and we will have several different reports. The Washington Amateur Radio Club volunteers track down an interfering signal. Regional organizations are wrapping up their preparations for the upcoming World Radio Conference. September is National Preparedness Month. And Flex Radio teams up with Raytheon to develop airborne HF radio systems for the military. We will have all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to answer the frequently asked question on what router should I get for my home network? And he'll talk about his passion for old keyboards. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will suggest what you should do when you encounter gatekeepers and bullies on the air. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his summer-long series entitled Amateur Radio History Headlines. And our tower climbing and antenna specialist, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here with another edition of his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1071 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service this week in amateur radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio overlooking the Hudson River here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York on this great almost fall day, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where the autumn leaves are slowly beginning to change color, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where someone has turned up the thermostat. Baby, it's hot outside. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And coming to you from Studio One in our Central Florida news bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our sunny downtown studios, at least for today, in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Our lead story this week is, of course, the amateur radio response to Hurricane Dorian. Amateur radio emergency service teams from Florida to Virginia went on alert this week, even before Dorian left the Bahamas and started making its way up the southeastern U.S. coast. As of 1800 UTC on September 5th, Dorian was back up to a Category 2 storm with maximum sustained winds of 110 miles an hour. It was 115 miles south-southwest of Wilmington, North Carolina, moving northeast at 8. The Florida Aries Net and the statewide SARNet repeater system were to remain activated until Florida emergency managers considered the storm no longer a serious threat. The three ARRL Florida sections conferred daily this week to assess the situation and to coordinate support. In Georgia, an Aries emergency net was activated on HF with a variety of coastal hospital, emergency operations centers on frequency, and other stations with Georgia's emergency management agency, Aries Mutual Assistance Teams, are standing by. Aries operators were deployed to two Georgia's emergency management sites to listen for assistance calls on HF and monitor several frequencies, as well as the D-STAR, the Georgia Echolink Conference Node, DE4544, They were also accepting assistance requests via WinLink. In South Carolina, Aries had been at the ready. The South Carolina Emergency Management Division radio room was operating 24-7, and the section leadership has been having regular conference calls. Rain and storm surge have been the primary threats, with extensive flooding reported in the coastal counties of Georgia and the Carolinas, coupled with high winds that down trees and causing power outages. 
FEMA announced it earlier that channels 1 and 2 of the 60-meter band are available as necessary for interoperability between federal government stations and U.S. amateur radio stations involved in the emergency. Channel 1, 5332 kilohertz center channel is reserved for primary voice traffic on the 5332 kilohertz channel center. 5330.5 kHz USB, and channel 2, 5348 kHz center channel for digital traffic. 5346.5 kHz USB with a 1.5 kHz offset to center for digital waveform. The ARRL emergency response team remains activated in monitoring mode, as is W1AW. WX4NHC at the National Hurricane Center announced the formal activation plans for Thursday and Friday. The VOIP hurricane net was activated Thursday in support. The net asked radio amateurs in affected areas or who can relay traffic from the affected area to provide surface weather data and damage reports for relay to WX4NHC. The FCC has granted ARRL's emergency request for a temporary waiver and has granted a one-week extension to permit only those radio amateurs active and involved in Hurricane Dorian response and relief efforts to use the PACTOR 4 digital protocol on HF. We conclude that granting the requested waiver is in the public interest, the FCC said in an order released September 6th. Hurricane Dorian has caused, and is likely to continue to cause, substantial damage in the southeast United States, and communication services will be disrupted. The waiver is limited to amateur radio operators using PACTOR 4 emissions in the continental United States who are directly involved with HF hurricane relief communications. Thus, to accommodate amateur radio operators assisting in the recovery efforts, we grant ARRL's waiver request until September 13, 2019. FCC Section 97.307, Subpart F of the FCC's Amateur Radio Service Rules, limits digital data emissions of amateur stations operating below 28 MHz to a symbol rate not to exceed 300 baud and stations operating in the 10-meter band 28.0 to 28.3 MHz to a symbol rate not to exceed 1200 baud, which precludes Pactor 4 emissions. Pactor 4 is a data protocol that permits relatively high-speed data transmissions in the HF bands, and many amateur stations active in emergency communications preparedness are capable of using this protocol, ARRL explained. The higher data rates offered by Pactor 4 are critical to sending hurricane relief communications, including lists of needed and distributed supplies, ARRL told the FCC. The waiver only applies to radio amateurs directly involved in the hurricane relief efforts involving the U.S. mainland. It does not extend to non-emergency communications. ARRL pointed out that stations involved in Hurricane Dorian response and relief efforts must be able to communicate with one another as well as with federal stations on the five channels on the 5 MHz band involved with the SHARES network and other interoperability partners on those frequencies. ARRL noted that its Pactor 4 waiver request to the FCC was without prejudice to the resolution of Docket 16-239, which is presently pending and addresses the rules section discussed herein. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The Hurricane Watch Net suspended operation temporarily on Friday, September 6th after a 139-hour marathon activation that began last Saturday. The net may reactivate if weather conditions dictate. The hurricane has been moving just offshore of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, HWN manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said. Friday morning, 
Hurricane Dorian made U.S. landfall at 1235 UTC over Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. By that time, Dorian had been downgraded to a Category 1 storm with maximum sustained winds near 90 miles per hour. As of 1700 UTC Friday, Dorian was moving away from the North Carolina coast and out into open waters of the Atlantic. The storm was located about 95 miles east-northeast of Cape Hatteras, with maximum sustained winds holding at 90 miles per hour. Hurricane Dorian was moving to the northeast at 17 miles per hour. According to the National Hurricane Center, dangerous storm surge impacts are likely in portions of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, southwestern Newfoundland, and eastern Nova Scotia this weekend. Hurricane force winds are also likely in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and possibly in Newfoundland Saturday and Sunday. Graves said that during the NETS marathon activation, NET members collected and forwarded countless surface reports to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Dorian has one last forecast landfall in Nova Scotia. Environment Canada has announced a hurricane watch is in effect for all of Nova Scotia. Tropical storm watches are in effect for southeastern New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, the Magdalen Islands, and western Newfoundland. According to the latest forecast guidance, the most likely track projection brings Hurricane Dorian south of the Maritimes on Saturday, pushing through eastern Nova Scotia Saturday night and then over the eastern Gulf of St. Lawrence waters or western Newfoundland by Sunday morning. Severe winds and torrential rain will have major impacts for southeastern New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, western Newfoundland, and the Quebec Lower North Shore. Large waves are expected for the Atlantic coasts of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and for eastern portions of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Storm surge combined with large waves and pounding surf may give flooding for parts of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and the Magdalen Islands. We have tentative plans to activate Saturday morning at 1500 UTC and remain active until perhaps as early as 0900 UTC on Sunday or until we've lost all propagation to the affected area, Graves said. Once this occurs, we will suspend all operations for Hurricane Dorian. This plan is subject to change as required. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2, the Americas, Emergency Coordinator Doug Mercer, VO1DM, advised radio amateurs to prepare their homes for high winds and rain and, were able, to monitor local repeaters. He directed Canadian radio amateurs to the IARU Emergency Center of Activity Frequencies. With Hurricane Dorian speeding up the east coast of the U.S., the Hurricane WatchNet has reactivated as of 1500 UTC, Dorian, a Category 1 storm, was some 200 miles south-southeast of Eastport, Maine, and about the same distance southwest of Halifax, Nova Scotia. The storm was moving to the northeast at 29 miles per hour. Hurricane WatchNet manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said the net will remain in operation until all propagation to the affected areas is lost. Once this occurs, we will suspend all operations for Hurricane Dorian, Graves said. In a follow-up notification, Graves added that due to no propagation between our net members in Nova Scotia on 7.268, we suspended operations until 2300 UTC. They continued net operations throughout the day on 14.325. Regardless of whether it is a hurricane or a post-tropical cyclone, Dorian is expected to have a significant impact in portions of eastern Canada beginning later today, Graves said. Dangerous storm surge is likely in portions of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, southwestern Newfoundland, and eastern Nova Scotia. Hurricane force winds are also likely in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland during the day on Saturday and into Saturday night. Environment Canada is issuing regular updates on Hurricane Dorian. In Newfoundland and Labrador, a CanWarn net will activate at 9 p.m. Newfoundland time on Saturday and will relay on-the-ground observations to Environment Canada Weather Office in Gander. 
An April report in Nature magazine says the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and NASA are asking the FCC to work with them to protect frequencies used for Earth observations from interference as 5G wireless rolls out. The FCC in April auctioned the first block of 5G spectrum with minimal protection. The sale reaped nearly $2 billion. Some of the 5G-bound frequencies are close to those used by satellites for Earth observation, and meteorologists have expressed fears that 5G transmissions could interfere with their data collection. The worry is that NOAA won't be able to detect concentrations of water vapor in the atmosphere accurately. Meteorologists rely on that data to feed into their models, and without it, weather forecasts worldwide could suffer. Because the United States is such a large communications market, the decisions the government makes on how to deploy 5G are likely to influence global discussions on how to regulate the technology. The article noted that telecommunications regulators will gather in Egypt in October and November, where delegates will hammer out international agreements for which frequencies companies will be able to use for 5G transmissions and what level of interference with Earth observation frequencies is acceptable. The recent FCC auction focused on two bands of that spectrum, between 24.25 and 24.45 gigahertz, between 24.75 and 25.25 gigahertz. Wireless equipment transmitting at the lower end of that range could interfere with the 23.8 gigahertz water vapor measurement. Nature said that FCC didn't respond to its request for comment. The FCC auction could set a noise limit on the U.S. 5G network of minus 20 dBW, much noisier than thresholds under consideration most systems around the world use. The European Commission has settled on a minus 42 dBW for 5G base stations, and the World Meteorological Organization is recommending minus 55 dBW. NOAA and NASA have reportedly finished a study on the effects of differing levels of noise interference, but that has not been made public, despite at least one formal request from Congress. The Department of Congress, which oversees NOAA, strongly supports the administration's policy to promote U.S. leadership in secure 5G networks, while at the same time sustaining and improving critical government and scientific missions. The Federal Emergency Management Agency sponsors National Preparedness Month each September to promote family and community disaster and emergency planning throughout the year. 2019 theme is Prepared, Not Scared. FEMA is a longtime ARRL partner agency. This year, FEMA wants participants, which include amateur radio emergency service volunteers, to share their activities and success stories, as well as a brief descriptions of their National Preparedness Month plans. An appropriate submission would be to your ARIES team's plan and conducted ARRL simulated emergency test or SET activity. The SET is designed to assess the skills and preparedness of ARIES and other organizations involved with emergency disaster response. And the 2019 SET is scheduled for October 5th and 6th weekend. Guidelines and specific SET reporting forms for the field organization leaders are on the ARRL website. Download and send completed forms to Steve Ewald, WV1X, at ARRL headquarters. See page 71 in the September 2019 issue of QST for more information on the 2019 set. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The FCC on August 26 announced that it had entered into a consent decree to resolve an investigation into whether the lighting fixture business Seasons 4 Inc. of Tuano, Virginia violated FCC rules by marketing LED products as the company's S4 lights without the required equipment authorization, labeling, and user manual disclosures, and by failing to produce certain required test records. These rules ensure that radio frequency devices marketed in the United States do not interfere with authorized communications, thereby maintaining network integrity and security and protecting consumers, the FCC said. 
As part of the resolution, S4 Lights admits it violated FCC rules and will implement a compliance plan and will pay a $25,000 civil penalty. The investigation concerned S4 Lights compliance with equipment authorization, labeling, user manual disclosure, and record retention rules in effect at the time of the violations, which included Parts 15 and 2 and Section 302, Subpart B of the Communications Act of 1934. According to the consent decree, the investigation stemmed from a 2017 complaint that a Christmas tree display using S4 Lights products at the Columbus, Ohio Zoo and Aquarium had caused harmful interference to authorize wireless communications in Powell, Ohio. Some of the rules in effect at the time the violations occurred were subsequently amended, effective November 2, 2017. As a result of the consent decree, S4 Lights avoids a hearing into the question of its basic qualifications to hold or obtain any FCC licenses or authorizations. Currently, most of the terrestrial radio stations in the U.S. broadcast either on the AM band from 540 to 1700 kilohertz or on the FM band from 88 to 108 megahertz. At the end of September 2018, the FCC announced that there were 4,464 stations on AM and 10,867 stations on FM. Due to the crowded nature of the existing bands, it has been hard to introduce new digital radio formats. DRM, or Digital Radio Mondiali, is a digital format designed to replace existing AM transmissions with clearer audio and with just 20% of the power. DRM Plus is the format for VHF-FM. WRNJ radio co-owner Larry Tai has now filed a petition for rulemaking with the FCC asking that the 45 megahertz to 50 megahertz band on the VHF spectrum be reallocated for DRM plus transmissions. In a statement, Ty said, the 45 to 50 megahertz band was allocated to two-way radio users in business and government who have since migrated to higher bands where they can use handsets with smaller antennas. As a result, this spectrum is extremely quiet right now. WRNJ monitored this bandwidth for an extended period of time and heard very few distant signals. There were 660 TV stations between Channel 2 and 7 before the transition to UHF for HDTV. There are now only approximately 60 TV stations in the U.S. on those old VHF channels. There is plenty of spectrum to share with a new service, DRM+, Plus, or any modulation, if the FCC really wants to move AMs. Even though the DRM standard has been around for over a decade, it is only recently that it has begun to make serious inroads to the broadcasting scene, with India, China, and Russia showing an interest. On the 11th of September 2018, it was reported that the Russian Federation proposed to use the digital DRM Plus standard for broadcasting on the frequency band 65.9 to 74 MHz and 87.5 to 108 MHz. It is noted that the implementation of the DRM Plus standard significantly increases the efficiency of the use of the radio frequency resource. In the frequency band of the DRM Plus 100 kHz radio channel, up to four stereophonic programs can be transmitted, including additional information. The standard allows you to enter additional data services, including text, statistical images, the traffic message channel, and also provide the ability to use the emergency systems. With DRM Plus, the number of radio channels is almost doubled and the operating cost and payback period of the new equipment are reduced by reducing the required transmitter power and the available capability of their operation in a single frequency network, which leads to additional energy savings. One of the current problems is the high cost of DRM receivers. Obviously, if the U.S. opted for a new DRM Plus allocation, it would give the format a huge boost. If it turned out to be the 45 to 50 megahertz allocation, then it raises the possibility of long distance reception by means of sporadic E during the summer months or via F2 propagation around the peak of the sunspot cycle. Responding to inquiries noting the lack of 4U1UN activity, the United Nations Amateur Radio Club indicated on its Facebook page this week that it's making slow but steady progress in its efforts to get the station back on the air from UN headquarters. 
The main difficulties in getting 4U1UN up and running again, following its displacement by renovations at UN headquarters, have been administrative and organizational, the club team said. The group explained that as a result of UN headquarters renovation, the room on the 41st floor of the 4U1UN radio equipment was relocated to the UN broadcast conference support section and is now off limits. Please do not think that United Nations Amateur Radio Club members gave up and are doing nothing, the club said in its post. After the successful activity of 4U70UN back in 2015, with the support of the UN administration, we were able to secure a tiny 20-square-foot room for the club's needs on the ground floor of the building. With no opportunity to run a feed line from the ground floor to the top of the building, and the tenuous hold even on the tiny bottom floor shack space, the club is in the process of installing a remotely controlled station on the 41st floor. The broadcast and conference support section is responsible for security of all UN communication systems, and only authorized personnel may be there, meaning club members must be accompanied by representatives when they are permitted access. Over the past weekend, Several UNARC members, representatives of UN services, and guests had an opportunity to continue equipment configuration. An assembled 19-inch rack and part of the equipment were disconnected during delivery to the 41st floor so that the BCSS personnel could hand carry the equipment up several flights of stairs to the top floor. After four hours of work, the connections of the Step R Big R vertical antennas were restored, a new SDA-100 controller was installed, and a remote rig 1216H was connected for easy remote access, the club said. The antenna was then tested and configured. The United Nations Amateur Radio Club says remote access from the first floor now works thanks to a separate Ethernet cable run up the entire height of the building for the club's use. Operation of the ACOM 2000A amplifier also was tested with the antenna, the station's Elecraft K3 transceiver had to be pulled from service and sent out for repair, however, after it was discovered to have suffered earlier static discharge damage. We really hope that in the very near future, after debugging and setting up all the equipment, we will finally be able to proudly look at the work done and begin to appear steadily on the bands, the club said. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Routers, it's a question that I get asked a lot. What's the best router? And it's kind of like saying, what's the best computer? I mean, there isn't a best computer. Uh, there's a best computer for you. There's a best router for you. But it's for you. And so there's no blanket. I can't say uh, with a blanket recommendation that, oh, well, everyone should just get this and be done with it. I wish I could. That would be a lot easier. But really, as always, you kind of have to ask some questions about how you're going to use it, uh, you know, what your issues are, why you why you want a new router, what Wi-Fi issues you have. There are a couple of basic things you must have, in my opinion, uh, in a router. And if your router doesn't currently have this, you should get a new router probably. And at least if you're getting a new router, you should make sure that your new router has a few features. Number one on the list is over-the-air firmware upgrades. And I know that maybe that's a that's a little confusing phrase, but you already have that on your phone, right? Your phone automatically updates. You have it on your laptop, on your desktop. Your computer automatically updates. Sometimes it'll say uh, the phone usually does. Hey, I've got updates. Do you want to update now? And you say yes, but that, and that's fine. But you want these updates pushed to you automatically. Most routers, until recently, 
you just never updated it. And if, if you were having problems, you, it's like the BIOS updates on older computers, which, by the way, are also now over the air automated. And in the old days, you'd say, oh, let me see if there's any update to the firmware on the router. Huh. No, you can't do that anymore because routers are the first thing, the one thing that you have sitting on the public Internet. That means they're the bearing the brunt of all the Internet attacks. There's constant attacks going on against these routers. Yes, your router. Because things like WannaCry, you know, that's the ransomware. Uh, these are called network worms because once they're on a machine, then they can go out and try to infect other machines. And they become part of what my friend Steve Gibson calls Internet background radiation. It's just constantly going on. There's a virus out there that was, we believe, created by the Russians. Uh, we're not sure why. We think maybe they're trying to use it to for cyber warfare. It's called VPN filter. You remember the, a couple of months ago, the FBI said everybody should reboot their routers. <laughs> That's because this, uh, this malware VPN filter lived in the memory of your router. And if you turned it off, you know, unplugged it and plugged it in again, it would clear it out of the memory. It wasn't exactly the right advice the FBI gave because it turned out that they could still get reinfected even if you rebooted it. Really, the only real fix for this kind of stuff is a firmware upgrade. That the, so it requires you to buy a router from, A, a manufacturer that's going to keep tabs on that software and update it regularly, and B, push it out to you because you can't be expected to go out and check. It's not your job. You, the router should uh, automatically update itself. And I would not buy these days. I would not buy a router that doesn't. It's just, uh, it's just too darn uh, risky. In fact, I would extend that to say anything that goes on the Internet should be updated automatically. That's why Windows and Macintosh and Android and iOS are all updated automatically nowadays. It's just table stakes. It's just the base requirement. So if your router is not updating automatically, well, get one that does. And if you're buying a new router, get one that does. So that's the first question you should ask. There is a newer standard. It turns out the... You know, every router, of course, and any decent modern router will have the ability to uh, put a password on the router. And what's actually happening there is it's encrypting its traffic. It's scrambling it. It gets descrambled with the password. That's important so that somebody who's in your vicinity can't snoop on what you're doing and can't join your network. So I hope that if you have a Wi-Fi router, you've turned on password protection. In general, it should be WPA2. And that's because the original password protection built into routers, WEP, was very badly designed and has been cracked. Turns out now WPA2 is pretty vulnerable. If you, if you don't use a good password, it's not so hard to crack. So if you're using WPA2, don't use a – and I do this. I, 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 I'm going to change my ways. For a long time I thought, well, it doesn't matter how good a password I use on that. No, it does, turns out. So use a good password. Because what can happen now, with even with WPA2, somebody, they still need to be able to see your Wi-Fi. They need to get it close enough, sit on your curb or whatever, to get a bunch of packets. But they can download those packets, then go home and run a brute force cracker on them and get your Wi-Fi password. Now, nobody's going to do that to you. Why would anybody care that much, right? So you're probably okay. But if you really want to be secure, use a long, strong password. That means it's very hard for them to brute force it. They can't crack it easily, even if they take it home and work on it for days and weeks and months. They can't get into it. If you use monkey123, they'll be into it in a couple hours. <laughs> Maybe not even that long. So use a good password. WPA3 does not have this vulnerability. It's been announced it will be coming. And a modern router, a router you buy today, should be WPA3 compatible if it has a fast enough processor. So those are all things to keep in mind. You would like a router that can be firmware upgraded to WPA3 if possible. That will give you more security. But it's not the end of the world if it doesn't. WPA2 is good enough if you use a nice, long, strong password. So what else should you look for in a router? Well, there are other considerations that may or may not be important. I usually like a router that is tri-band. So you remember the early Wi-Fi routers were 802.11b. That was at the 2.4 gigahertz band. There have been new updates to that, and then we're now at 802.11ac, and it can use both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. 
And in fact, there are two different segments of the 5 gigahertz band that it can use. So that's a tri-band router. It uses 2.4 gigahertz and high and low 5 gigahertz. Why do you want three bands? Well, because in many cases, congestion is a problem these days. Not only are you using many devices, but so is your neighbor. Your neighbor's Wi-Fi is overpowering your Wi-Fi. One of the things, one of the problems with Wi-Fi is it's a collision-based network, which means if your Wi-Fi router starts sending data and, and your neighbor's Wi-Fi router starts sending data, your router will go, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, and stop for a random amount of time before it begins again. Two different Wi-Fi routers can't talk on the same frequency at the same time. So one will stop and politely wait for the other to finish. This is probably not what you want. Probably not what you want. So my suggestion is uh, <laughs> get a, a tri-band router. You're much more likely to be able to find a frequency that isn't stepped on by your neighbor. What about those mesh routers? Well, they're very expensive, but often they work well for people who are having problems because either they have so many devices attached to their Wi-Fi or more likely because they're so spread out. One Wi-Fi unit will cover about 1,500 square feet. If you have a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot house or more, you might need a extender. And that's what mesh does particularly well. There's plume, there's velop. There's, I mean, I can go on and on and on. There are a lot of manufacturers that make these. The other advantage of those is, in every case, they are over-the-air updatable. That's one of the things Wi-Fi mesh routers do, is they constantly get updates so that they work better on your network. It's one of the reasons you pay a little more for them. But you may not need it. If you have a small area, you're not having problems with Wi-Fi, you just want you know, maybe a little better speed or a little more modern router with better security, you probably can just get a simple Wi-Fi router. We'll be back with more from our tech guy, Leo Laporte, right after we take this quick pause for stations along the network to identify. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Look at this thing. I have in my hands a piece of history. You know, one of the things about technology that's generally the case, uh, they called it Moore's Law, really, right? Uh, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, said that the, the – well, what he said literally was – what did he say? The density of transistors on a processor, on a chip, would double every 18 months. That's what he said. But it's often uh, translated into the power of a chip. The capabilities of a chip would double every 18 months. And that's roughly roughly the same. And if, if, you, uh, if you understand doubling every 18 months, you understand, well, it doubles. And then in three years, it quadruples. And then in, uh, in uh, four and a half years, it uh, eight times eight. And because it's doubling every year and a half, you know, it doesn't take long before you get up some pretty powerful stuff. And we've seen that, haven't we? In fact, we're finally, at this point, I think, getting to the point where processors aren't getting much faster. They're not, it's, the number of transistors might be doubling, I guess, but uh, I don't think so. We get, we got the point now where there's so much density on the processor, you can't get much more dense. So in general, though, what that means is things get faster and cheaper, lower power. I mean, it's kind of a miracle. It's the miracle of the microcosm as George Gilder said. And it's what's powered Silicon Valley. And yet there are some things that don't follow that rule, physical things, like, I don't know, keyboards. Screens have gotten better, haven't they? Oh, yeah. You can't use a screen. Five-year-old, I was looking at an old uh, Apple uh, Mac, Macintosh Air, MacBook Air, and uh, that screen is uh, not a, what we call, what Apple calls a retina display. It's not a very high resolution. And you can see it's like blurry. It looks like it's a little out of focus. And then you use one of the more modern high resolution displays, PC or Mac, and you go, yeah, that's crisp. You watch TV now on a 4K HDR screen. It's like, wow, that looks real. So screens have gotten a lot better. But you know, there's another input device you use, another something you use every time you use a computer that has gotten worse. 
and I think everybody agrees, have gotten worse. Keyboards. Keyboards and Apple's the worst. Apple's keyboards are horrible. So I did a strange thing the other day. I went to a website called clickykeyboards.com and I bought <laughs> I bought a 28-year-old keyboard. It's an IBM M series keyboard that are widely considered by keyboard connoisseurs to be among the best, not maybe the best. The predecessor to the M was the F series that some say were better, but uh they're, they have an odd layout. This is the this is the 104 key, modern keyboard layout, so that's good. For it was, I guess, for an IBM PC, right? The thing's heavy. Things like almost six pounds. <laughs> it's bulky. It's a beast, and it uses this key technology uh, that is looks medieval. It's what they call a buckling spring keyboard, and so under each key. There's literally, literally a spring that as you depress it, it compresses like a spring normally would until it gets to the point where it can't compress anymore and it goes doing, it's, it's, it's jumps sideways. You've seen springs do that. You press it, press it, press it, and go doing. <laughs> well, normally that's a defect, right? But in this keyboard, that's what it's supposed to do. When it springs sideways, there's a little hip check. It closes the switch and the key is typed. A buckle, it buckles, a buckling key. Now we've come up with, Everybody seems to think a better better system since then. You know, your most keyboards nowadays have a rubber dome that you press. This makes much more sense. I don't know who thought up this buckling key is a very strange technology. The rubber dome it makes sense. You press the key, the dome compresses like a little air bubble, and it closes the switch, and that's the keystroke. They're softer. They last a long time. You can have less travel, which is important because we're making computers thinner and thinner. But you get to the point sometimes where it gets too thin. Somebody said, I think it was Casey Johnston, she, she's, she hates the new Macintosh keyboards, that Apple's suffering from design anorexia. The, the kind of almost at this point, psychotic desire for thinness to the point where you're losing functionality. Apple's laptops are so thin, <laughs> they don't have room for the keys to move. So they had to develop a new switch. They call it the butterfly key. And a switch that just, it locks that key in place. It's very solid, very rigid. Travels about a millimeter. I think a little more, maybe a millimeter and a half. And then, boom, hits bottom, closes the switch, and you've typed the key. But it's, uh, it, for a lot of us, it's not it's not a satisfactory feeling. It doesn't move very far. It's all, I mean, you could compare that to typing on an iPad, where you're typing on glass, where there's no motion. That's even worse, right? It's hard to be accurate. You want a little feedback. You want to know that your finger is depressed a key. Something's happened. Maybe a nice solid chunk. That's for us old school types. Now, if you ever used a typewriter, it's even worse, right? A manual typewriter, you literally are flipping up a lever boom, that hits the paper, the plate, and boom, with an audible clack. These aren't quite as clacky as that, but this is the Model M key. You want to hear what a buckling? This is. This will remind you of visiting the Department of Motor Vehicles or maybe at the airport. Uh, I'm sorry. We can get you on a later flight. Let me just check. That's, that's, <laughs> that's that sound. And actually, I think ergonom ergonometric folks, ergo ergonomics is a study of uh, motion and uh, and in the body, say that these these keyboards are better for you, less likely to cause car what they call carpal tunnel syndrome within the. I don't know. Is that true? They're sure more satisfying. You know, you hit a key. It's like a sledgehammer. It weighs like a sledgehammer too. Maybe this is my protest against the Apple keyboards. There's another bigger problem with the Apple keyboards, which Apple's finally admitted, which is that if a crumb gets under this little tiny key, there's no way to get it out. They, you, have, you have to pretty much replace the keyboard. And uh, guess what? It turns out a certain percentage of computer users, I don't know who would do this, eat croissants and cookies and crackers and Cheetos when they're typing. And they get under the keys quite a bit. <laughs> it's food. Yes. Who would do that? No, you should be in a clean, sterile environment washing your hands. I'm sure that's what Apple thought when they tested it. They needed to get some Cheeto users in there to test it. People eating their Fritos, Doritos, Biscoff cookies. Get them in there and test it. Then see what happens. Apple said, all right, all right, we'll replace your gosh darn keys. 
or your entire keyboard if we have to. It's expensive because Apple also, when they made these special keyboards, they glued the battery to the back of them. So when you when you can't take the key caps off, it'll break them, especially the space bar. So they can't really just uh, take them apart and clean it with a compressed air as you used to do in the old days. No, they actually have to unscrew the entire computer and take the top off and replace it for seven hundred dollars. It's a lot for a fourteen hundred dollar computer. Give me buckling springs. <laughs> or, uh, I guess I, I guess I'm officially an old an old guy now. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. The African Telecommunications Union held its final preparatory meeting ahead of World Radio Telecommunications Conference 2019, convened by the International Telecommunications Union. Attending the session in South Africa was Brian Jacobs, ZS6YZ, who represented the South African Radio League and the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 as part of the South African delegation. Delegates reached consensus on several items of interest to the amateur service. The highlights include agreement on an African common proposal allocating 50 to 54 megahertz to the amateur service in Region 1 on a primary basis with provisions to allow wind profile radars and amateur service to avoid mutual interference. Discussion on spectrum to be considered for the International Mobile Telecommunications, which ATU has agreed should not include the primary amateur band at 47 to 47.2 gigahertz. Agreement to an AFCP that retains the current regulatory position in the 5725 to 5850 megahertz band, which includes secondary allocations to the amateur and amateur satellite service. No change to the international radio regulations regarding wireless power transfer for electric vehicles, but with a continuation of international telecommunications sector studies to ensure that appropriate frequency ranges and technical limits are incorporated into standards to protect radio services. In ITU Region 3, the Australian Radio Study Group 5 met for the final time on August 23rd. In advance of WRC 19, the Australian Radio Study Group addresses terrestrial systems and networks for the fixed mobile, radio location, and amateur satellite services in Australia and provides key technical inputs to the meetings of ITUR for working parties 5A, 5B, C, and 5D the Asian Pacific Telecommunity, and WRC-19. Australian Communications and Media Authority sites in Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne are linked via video conference to review progress towards relevant WRC-19 agenda items and the discussing the outcomes of recent international meetings and to decide of any follow-up actions. Coordinators for each WRC-19 agenda item brief the meeting on the progress of the work at ITU-R and the outcome of the fifth conference preparatory group meeting held in July and August in Tokyo, which reached preliminary APT common proposals for WRC-19. The Australian Radio Study Group 5 meeting also discussed the upcoming final meeting of the Department of Communications and the Arts Preparatory Group 19 set for September 16. The DOCA is responsible for communications policy and programs, the PGWRC-19 meeting will finalize Australia's positions on WRC-19 agenda items and provide security and operational information for the Australian delegation to the conference. World Radio Communications Conference 2019 will take place October 28 through November 22 at Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. Foundations of Amateur Radio one of the recurring topics in my experience of amateur radio is that associated with people who use the hobby as an excuse to sow discontent. That comes in many forms. At the extreme end, it's harassment, 
but it also comes in the form of gatekeepers and naysayers. It's important to realise that while this behaviour is not limited to amateur radio, we seem to have more than our fair share of the negative element. When you come into this community all bright-eyed, excited, willing to learn, you might be astonished just how negative some community members can be. You might pick up a special friend who follows you around, either on air or online, rarely in real life, who makes it their mission to make your life a misery. This behaviour manifests itself with statements about the unsuitability of your licence, your equipment, your gender, your knowledge, your examination process, your chosen frequency, your selected mode, anything that's not to the liking of whomever challenged your existence. This kind of behaviour is known as gatekeeping, and in amateur radio it's rife. People with a chip on their shoulder the size of Montana, with nothing better to do than to berate new amateurs, tell them off, preferably as a mean to explain to them why they should leave the hobby or are not worthy of being considered an amateur. In addition to these delightful utterances, I regularly see sexist, racist and other content shared among our community that would not be condoned in the workplace, let alone in the family home. Why do we as a community tolerate this extreme behaviour, when in the rest of our lives this is strongly discouraged and can lead to severe consequences such as dismissal and legal proceedings? In civil discourse we treat each other with respect, and that should be there regardless of the environment, be it professional, the home, or in this case a hobby. It's been said that for some people in amateur radio, their biggest life achievement was the gaining of their amateur license. The acronym Fig Jam comes to mind to describe some of those entitlement-rich individuals. So what do you do when you are confronted with a repeater troll, or told that you don't measure up because you don't know Morse, or some other denigrating statement? Previously, I would have advocated that you ignore it and move on. Oftentimes, you've done nothing wrong and there's nothing to be gained from arguing the point. There's only one problem with that. There's no cost to the bully. Let's face it, we're talking about bullies. Minor or major, still a bully. No cost means no disincentive, which means that the behaviour continues until the bully gets bored. Only problem is that you'll need to weather the storm while that happens. Not good for you your mental health, or the mental health of the people around you. That's not good balance. As a community, it's our job, that is, my job and your job, to call out this behaviour and to expose it for what it is. Abhorrent, elitist, sexist, racist, gatekeeping. I've been told that this isn't real, and that I should leave this alone. And to that I say, no, this is my hobby too and I get to have a say about what kind of hobby community I'd like to be part of. So instead, I think we as a community need to do something more active. I think we, that is, you and I, need to call out a bully when we encounter one. It doesn't have to be confrontational, however satisfying that might be, but it needs to draw a line in the sand. For example, you might say something like this. Thank you for your comment. I don't believe that it is in the spirit of amateur radio. Please stop. It's not going to end the behaviour of the bully, but it does achieve some other things. If this is online, it will flag for future readers that something is amiss, and on air it will highlight to fellow frequency users that you're not okay with what's going on. It does some other things as well. For you, it will give you a sense of ownership of what's going on around you, rather than being pushed into the role of victim. It will also give the bully a statement that's neutral whilst indicating that their behaviour is unacceptable. I think that the only way out of the keyboard warrior and repeater troll hell we find ourselves in is to do something different. To make noise, to shine a light, and to discourage bad behaviour. One thing I can say from personal observation is that what we as a community have done to date isn't working. It's getting worse. We're alienating good people who want to make a contribution, and we're doing nothing to discourage those who are sure of their position and are unapologetic about how they express that superiority. Step up. Call it out. Thank you for your comment. I don't believe that it's in the spirit of amateur radio. Please stop. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Ingenuity and craftsmen abound within the amateur radio community, as shown in the results of the 2019 QST Key Competition. More than two dozen entries were submitted, and the judges gathered in late July to evaluate them. The competition sought Morse code key and paddle designs in four categories, straight key, semi-automatic key, or bug, paddle, and side swiper. Each was a mechanical work of art, but there could only be four winners who were chosen based on ingenuity of design, ergonomics of operation, and overall craftsmanship. The winners are Straight Key, Ron Spooner, W6FIF, Semi-Automatic or Bug, Gary Johnson, NA6O, Paddle, Jurgen Malner, NV1Q, and Side Swiper, Stan Lewandowski, WB2LQF. Participants had to submit their individual keys, which were returned following judging, as well as detailed construction drawings with dimensions, list of materials, photos, and written descriptions. The winner in each category will receive $250. Volunteers from the Skagit Amateur Radio Emergency Communications Club in Anacortes, Washington, recently assisted the U.S. Coast Guard in tracking the source of interference on VHF Marine Channel 5A, 156.250 megahertz. This channel serves the commercial vessel traffic service north of Bush Point on Whidbey Island, as well as some Canadian waters in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The service offers monitoring and navigational assistance for ships in the region. The club reports that the channel was unusable for 30 hours, forcing all traffic to other channels. Club volunteers promptly tracked down the source of the offending signal, a fishing vessel at the Squalicum Harbor fuel dock, and traffic on Channel 5A was able to resume. Last fall, club volunteers were also able to pin down an interference problem for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. In a strategic partnership with Raytheon and U.S. amateur radio equipment manufacturer Flex Radio, that company has been selected by the U.S. Air Force to adapt its off-the-shelf Smart SDR Flex 6000 architecture for HF modernization of airborne communications. The new radio will provide beyond-the-line-of-sight long-distance communication for air crews. We're excited to convey that our proven modular direct sampling hardware Open Waveform API and IP-based architecture provides a ready platform for agile development to meet 21st century communications needs, Flex Radio CEO Gerald Youngblood, K5SDR, commented. Throughout Flex Radio's history, commercial amateur products have been leveraged in defense products, which in turn have been leveraged back into commercial products. We're certain that these efforts will cycle back again. Youngblood said the deal could boost its amateur radio and commercial products and services, and while he couldn't go into all the details, the positive impact to the business process, infrastructure, intellectual property, and human resources will enhance their amateur and commercial products and services. So stay tuned for more amateur product announcements coming soon. Raytheon received a $36 million project agreement in support of requirements from the U.S. Air Force Life Cycle Management Center to develop and qualify HF radio. The Consortium Management Group's mission is to speed development of technologies to improve U.S. government capabilities required to sustain U.S. military supremacy in weapons systems information technology. Barbara Borgonovi, a vice president, said Raytheon's partnership with Flex Radio combines commercial innovation with advanced military hardening techniques to rapidly deliver a next-generation operational capability that supports strategic and tactical missions. The Raytheon Flex Radio team is one of two recipients for this development. After a 31-month period of performance, one team will be named to move on to production. Worldwide high-frequency communications is what our commercial customers do every day, using virtually every mode of operation and type of propagation, Youngblood said. 
Our partnership brings together the vast resources and experience of Raytheon in airborne tactical communication systems with Flex Radio's commercial off-the-shelf high-frequency software-defined radios. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, W2GBO, on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's Capital Region. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved. You've just listened to a truncated version of 